A few weeks ago, I published a video where I discussed treating a woman with an MS relapse during the COVID pandemic. You guys asked some awesome questions, and in this video, I'm going to answer those questions. Don't turn away, because that starts right now. Hey! Howdy. Thanks for learning about MS with me, Aaron Boster. I started this YouTube channel to help my own MS clinic patients learn between visits, and it's my hope that through these videos, I can help you learn too. A few weeks back, I published a video where I shared an experience of treating a woman with multiple sclerosis who was suffering an attack in the midst of a COVID pandemic. I'll throw a link up above in case you haven't seen that video. I had a bunch of really provocative questions from the viewers on this channel. And so in this video, I'm going to be answering those questions. Let's jump in. Crystalline asks, how soon after initial signs of a relapse should you ideally get treated? Crystalline, that's an excellent question. And the way I think about it is as follows. If you have new neurological deficits lasting longer than a day in duration, I want you to bring that to the attention of your MS provider. If I hear about new neurological deficits lasting longer than a day in duration, I'm going to want to see that person in clinic. And on exam, I'm looking for objective exam findings that buttress their story. I'm also obviously going to want to check for a urinary tract infection to make sure they don't have a UTI before I consider treating them with steroids. If the person has deficits on exam, if they have no UTI, and if they have these new symptoms, which have been lasting longer than a day, I think it's reasonable to talk about treatment. Now, ideally, I want to treat the attack as early as feasible. I would not like to wait weeks and weeks into an attack before we initiate treatment. Is it impossible to treat an attack a month after it's occurred? No, it's not impossible. It's just not ideal. Lee asks, I'm just really concerned about this young woman. I hope she's getting positive results from the new direction. Thank you for treating her at a time like this. Maybe, doctor, you can let us know if she responds to the medicines in an upcoming video. Well, Lee, thank you very much for your concern. I'm happy to share that overall we're feeling positive and as a team we're ready to take next steps in her treatment. Thanks for asking. Chris C writes, Dr. Boster, is the amount of time that you're delaying starting a new DMT dictated by the current DMT uh, this patient's currently taking? Or are you wanting to stop the patient's current flare-up before starting a new DMT? Chris, that's an awesome question. I actually have an entire video dedicated to this topic, transitioning from drug A to drug B and whether or not a washout is necessary. I'll throw a link up above to that video in case you'd like to check it out. In this instance, it was complicated, and our focus was on treating the attack. This was her second attack on this given drug, and so we also made the decision to transition off of the DMT onto something else. Our approach was first treat the attack, and then double back a couple weeks later to discuss transitioning to a different DMT. She has in fact decided to switch drugs and she'll be starting her new disease modifying therapy probably in about a month. Terry G asks, Dr. Boster, why would you not treat an exacerbation during COVID-19? Everything in medicine is a risk benefit and this is no exception. And with each individual human being, with each individual case, we have to weigh the risk of a therapy against the potential benefit. Giving someone high dose steroids will temporarily suppress some of their immune response. And in the setting of a global viral pandemic, there's obviously a potential increased risk. In this example, it was beneficial to treat her, and she and her husband and I are all in agreement that it was the right move. Thank you for asking the question. Laura writes, have you ever used the steroids that the patient self-infuses at home daily? I've met with a nurse that sets up a line and then I flush it daily with saline and hook up a little grenade-shaped ball that infuses in about an hour. At the end of the packs, I have three day and a five day pack. I just slip out the line and place on a band-aid. This would limit in office visits. Laura, thank you for sharing this experience. I've given steroids lots of different ways. I am not a fan of the way that you describe taking steroids. I'll be honest with you. I'm not a fan of asking a human who is not medically trained to maintain the safety of an IV. I am not inclined to have a nurse set something up and then walk away. And it would be my strong preference that an IV administration was done under supervision. Now I do have to tell you that high dose oral steroids has been proven to be safe, tolerated, and as effective as IV. And so my first thought when reading your question was, why not just use high dose oral steroids? Natasha shares, thanks Aaron, 
I recently had the same situation. Also went with high dose steroids, but IV. Just wondering, what is the rough time frame for your immune system to recover from corticosteroid treatment? Thanks. Natasha, that's a great question. It's actually a complex question. I view high dose IV steroids or high dose oral steroids for a short period of time to be a rather different set of variables than taking chronic low dose steroids. So for example, sometimes when treating a rheumatologic condition, a patient might take say 20 or 30 milligrams of prednisone every single day. In my mind, that is a form of oral immunosuppression. And over time, that person's immune system is properly suppressed. It's a bit different when you give someone high dose corticosteroids for only a couple days. It will suppress their immune response, but it doesn't do it to the same extent and certainly not for the same duration. Now, another way of thinking about this is what mechanistically is happening when you give steroids. Mechanistically, you're changing the DNA of the white blood cells and those changes last the duration that those cells live. So we're talking on the order of months. That was a great question. Thank you for asking. Cindy asks an awesome question. She says, hi, Dr. Boster. Thank you for the video. We well, are welcome, Cindy. It's very helpful content. One observation. I noticed you didn't mention having an MRI done. Is this because of the pandemic or another reason? Cindy, thank you for asking this question. If I'm helping take care of someone with MS, and they have a new neurological deficit lasting longer than a day, and I examine them and I can find evidence of deficit on exam, I don't need an MRI. I have the human being teaching me that they're having an attack. And if I got an MRI that showed a new spot, I could say, well, I already knew that. And if I got an MRI that didn't show a new spot, it doesn't mean they're not having an attack. They are, I can see it. And so in my strong opinion, if I can confirm the attack based on history and physical, and I can prove they don't have an infection by checking their urine, for example, there's no cause to get an MRI in my opinion. I will treat them and then I will follow up in clinic where again, I'll listen to how they're doing and examine them to look for improvement. An MRI is not necessary. If you are impacted by MS and you wanna up your game, click the video on your screen right now. Go ahead and click it. My name's Aaron Boster and thank you for learning about MS with me. Until my next video or my next live stream or the next time I see you in clinic, stay safe and take care.